Do you dream of fairies and princesses? Then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauly, and today on the show, I have my friend Jeff Victor with me for the first time. Hello, Jeffrey. How's it going? Uh, good, how are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm going to call you Victor the whole time. Thanks. Just because I... people get confused if I call you Jeff. We're always the two Jeffs whenever we go out, and that's he right. always calls me Victor. That's true. That's my last name. I think Victor is a better name for you. Debatable. I like <laughs> Jeff, too. Or Jeffrey, but you know. Anyway, we're here today to talk about storytelling in Disney attractions. Of course, Disney is one of those companies that I feel like is always giving accolades for being the greatest storytellers in the world. And in a lot of cases, I agree. But there are some cases where I totally, totally disagree with that fact. And so today we're going to go through some attractions that we feel are, have the best storytelling and some that have the worst storytelling. So let's get to that right now. It's time to dive into today's Disney dialogue. Okay, Victor, what do you want to start with? The best or the worst? I, we'll go back and forth. but when it, I we'll, feel like we should start positive on today. Okay, so, so let's start with the best. Give me one of your best storytelling attractions that Disney has created. So this is relatively new to the park, and I would say Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. Okay. From going into the collector's room, seeing all of his, as you go through, you see all of his collections, and then you hear the story about how the Guardian collected them and captured them for trying to steal something, and then Rocket breaks them out, and you go through that whole storyline, and you know, there's a bunch of different videos that you get during the ride. All of them tie into the same flow. Now, one of the things I judge when it comes to attractions based on intellectual properties is how well does the story work if you're unfamiliar with the film, TV show, whatever it's tied to? So how do you think Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout works if you're not familiar with the movies? That's actually an interesting question because if you're not familiar with them, mm -hmm. chances are it will be a little bit confusing because there's, I think, six characters and they're all very different characters. Mm -hmm. However... Once you go into the pre-show room with Rocket, you kind of understand how he works. Yeah. And then the ride kind of goes from there. Yeah. Now, I am familiar with the movies, so I can't maybe objectively answer that 100%. But I actually think it does a really good job telling the story because I'm just trying to think. If I didn't know anything about Guardians, I feel like the villain character is set up very well. I mean, you see the statue of him at the entrance. What's his name? The Tavan. Yeah, the collector. The collector. You see the statue of him at the entrance, which you could be like, okay, is this a good guy or a bad guy? But I feel like in that first room, the video there, it's made pretty darn clear that he's the bad guy. And then you've got the video of the, is it six guardians? Are there six of them or five? There's Groot and... and Groot, Star-Lord, Gamora, Mantis, Drax... I think it's just the five, five. right? Yeah. So the and Rocket, so six. Six, okay, there we go. So the six of them are caged up. Like, you know, the way that they're presented, it's very clear that these are all guys in the same team. They're all locked up together. So I think they actually do a really good job of that. And then even more clear when you're in his his um, his office. So yeah, I actually think it does a really... Uh, where I, You know what? I think the pre-show does the best job telling the story. Once you get on the actual attraction... I think it's kind of confusing. And I think mostly... Um, is it the giant monster that comes out from nowhere? No, it's... You know what it is? It's the uh, fact that you can't hear very well on that attraction. Right. Have you noticed that uh, on the elevator, on the lift, excuse me, you can't hear what's the story very well? Yeah, that's the one thing they changed from uh, Twilight... Uh, Twilight of Terror. Twilight Zone Tower Twilight Terror. Twilight Zone Tower Terror is I really wish they would have updated the cart a little bit uh -huh. to have speakers behind the head like in modern attractions so that you can Well, I feel like hear. they used to in Twilight. They do. They have speakers on the lift. The problem is I think, and I could be wrong, but I, the way that I feel is the the audio dial the dialogue audio is actually not Downplayed on the Downplayed to the music. I think the music is on the lift, but the dialogue is not i think it's coming from the, the set piece that you're looking yeah. from so i think that that's wrong so in that respect i do 
at that point, we know the story. We know that Rocket has, you know, uh, manipulated this elevator so that we're doing what he wants it to do. We know we're there to get them out. But but what exactly is going on? I'm never really quite sure. I'm like, okay, well, we helped them escape. And that's all you really need to know. And there's a fun song to jam out to. Right. There's many different songs yes, to but, jam out to. But I would say, leading up to that ride, they actually do a really good job telling the story. And then on the ride, you already know what's going on. But following what's going on isn't the easiest. Right. And com- going back again to your question of if you don't know the films. Now, I know you're not a big Marvel fan. Correct. And knowing that you followed along just fine. Well, I have seen those movies, though. Right. But yeah. it, that's a good story for, like, the general goer. Yeah, I think if you have never seen it, you would pick it up pretty quickly. Who's who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? And Rocket does a fine job explaining it in the office. So right. I would put that on good storytelling as well. It was not on my list, but I would agree with you. But interestingly enough, what was on my list, don't peek at my list, what was on my list is uh, a similar attraction. It is the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, which I think is probably one of the best uh, jobs telling a story ever on an attraction. Now, I'll talk specifically about the Florida one because it's no longer at Disneyland or at Disney California Adventure. But I think that the way that that attraction set up, both Tower of Terror and Guardians, the, the, it's the pre-show in the library or office or whatever you want to call it, it just gives you the opportunity to really tell a story in a pre-show way that's actually kind of interesting. Let's face it, a lot of times, once you've seen a pre-show once, you start ignoring it every time after that. I never really ignore it for Guardians or Tower of Terror. So I feel like they make it interesting and give you the important information. Right, like in uh, Tower of Terror, I love when it goes dark and then the screen flashes on and you see the the story bring come to life and telling the the whole point of like how the elevator and trapped all the guests in room floor and floor 13. And yeah, I love that we can see them in the hallway and those characters that we met in the pre-show video are there. And I, I think if I had to pinpoint a specific moment, actually, even in the Florida one, have you ever done the Florida one? I have. Okay. So when you get up like to the, the fifth dimension sequence where the elevator pushes forward, that's a little bit like what's going on. But if I'm remembering correctly, there is the Rod Serling narration going on during that explaining what's going on. So overall, I think Tower of Terror is probably one of the best examples of really, really, really good storytelling in a Disney attraction. And once again, I don't think you need to know the Twilight Zone to understand that attraction. I don't think you need to know the Twilight Zone at all to understand that attraction. I don't think I did the first time I saw it. I've told the story many times. The thing that got me into the Twilight Zone was actually an episode of Felicity that that they did based on the Twilight Zone, which is very weird and obscure, but true. So I think that that may have been before the first time I rode that attraction, and I wouldn't be surprised. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror made them a fan of the Twilight Zone. I'm sure they looked into it after. And, of course, there's tons of references. That's one of those attractions that if you do know the original, you are getting a lot of Easter eggs throughout the attraction that make it even more exciting. Right, especially with all the props on the wall. Oh, yeah, tons everywhere. And, uh, yeah, it's great. Good stuff. So was that on your list? I'm just curious. That was not. It was going to be my honorable mention. Okay. Um, don't, don't. But I changed it to Guardians just because I wanted to do something new that was in the park. So same ride concept. I felt similar to both attractions. So Perfect. Now I want to hear one that you think does absolutely terrible at telling a story. So this is my controversial one. Oh, I can't wait. It is Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, you know, I'm not going to lie. This, I contemplated list this for my bad list. I didn't put it on there, but I did contemplate it. Now, don't get me wrong. This is one of my favorite rides in the park. Yeah. But I think it's one of the worst stories. You start off in Louisiana. and you're Well, going- it's not. Well, let's rephrase that. We're storytelling. Storytelling. I don't care whether or not you like the story. It's whether or not it tells oh, no, no. the story yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you start off in Louisiana, and then you see the pirate thing, and you drop down, and all the pirates are dead. Yes. You're pretty much starting at the end of a story, and then you get little vignettes that are fun to watch. Yep. 
But what's going on? Very little clue. And I know the movie pulled little bits and pieces from the vignettes to try to drag into the movie. So some people are aware of like what's happening with Barboza and he's firing at the mainland and there's a battle there. And then obviously they just changed the second scene with the red lady. The red lady, the, red, the redhead. The redhead. <laughs> she's in a red dress and she's magically, is she Irish or Scottish now? Oh, yeah, she does have an accent, doesn't she? Yeah, I think it's she's, Irish. She's something. But then you go through it, and then there's a random scene where everything's on fire, and then there's just drunk sailors at the end of the ride shooting each other, and then Jack Sparrow is surrounded by treasures saying, drink up, me hearties, yo-ho, and then the ride ends with a parrot chirping at you. Yeah, I... So let's start at the beginning. You said it kind of tells the story backwards, which is interesting because Disneyland Paris actually noticed this. And the attraction in Disneyland Paris is pretty much the attraction backwards. Like one of the first scenes you see are the the pirates in the prison with the dog. Yeah. And at the end, you see them as skeletons. So I do think that Paris actually plussed the attraction in that way. I think the story makes more I sense. I definitely there. think they fixed it. Yeah. And as far as, like, what's going on, I would agree. Now, I have, I was listening to something recently or read something recently. I can't remember what it was. But they were talking about how as the years go on, the attraction actually makes less sense. Because, you know, when they were auctioning off women, that is something that you would do when you uh, pillage a town and, you know, burn it to the ground. Right, especially for the 1800s when this is probably taking, or 1700s. I don't even, I'm terrible when it comes to that stuff. I don't even know the year that it would be. But, but as far as like auctioning off chickens, I don't know if you'd necessarily have a friendly auction in the middle of town, in the middle of all of this stuff going on. So that doesn't make sense these days. Uh, The Jack Sparrow stuff, although cool, and I actually like it, agreed, it's not exactly clear. I mean, I guess it's clear that people are looking for Jack Sparrow, right? They want to get him and, you know, hurt him. But I wouldn't disagree with you. It's a hard one to put on the list because it's such a classic. And I'm not going to lie, Haunted Mansion was also almost on my list. I won't, you know, we'll, I'll see if it's on your list. We'll leave that alone. Let's not get to that yeah. yet. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I know. For such a classic attraction, I don't think the storytelling is as strong as people might assume or think it is just because of its status. Right. And then there's the random cameos of Captain Hook and Shmee in the first uh, s- scene where you see Jack Sparrow. Well, it's they're not like... Them. They're pirates, it, but then you're like, why are they but specifically... But it's not Captain Hook and Shmee. They totally... There's a, He's wearing a red jacket. He's got a hook. And there's Shmee's a lot, wearing his striped okay, outfit. There are a lot Captain of... Captain Hook and Shmee. But that's a very classic pirate look that is not captain hook and smee but in any case i'm gonna choose one of my bads now one of my bads and this this one is ashamedly bad in my opinion and that is the little mermaid attractions at both disney california adventure and at magic kingdom this was on your list this was definitely on my list this one is one of those ones that if you do not know the movie you will have no idea what's happening other than somebody's drowning me and yeah, that's about it. Somebody's drowning me, and yeah, I, I have no idea. It's 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 a musical review, which is fine, I guess. I always hear Imagineers, and I think Tony Baxter specifically refers to these as book report attractions, where it's essentially a book report retelling the story of the movie. But I'm so even the introduction of Ursula. It's kind of like, who is this woman when you first see her, if you've never seen the movie? Right, you see the eels, and then all of a sudden she comes out singing Poor Unfortunate Souls. My favorite scene, though, is when you go from Kiss the Girl. Yeah. The next scene is like <laughs> Ursula dying in the background, yeah. and she's like this little teeny shadow figure. And yeah. you're like, what? How do you go from kissing the girl to die, Ursula, die? Yeah, that's kind of an unforgivable attraction in the sense. And I actually do enjoy that attraction, mostly because there's never much of a wait for it. And like, yeah, like. It's the air conditioning ride. Yeah, it's an air conditioning ride. Got great music. Got a beautiful animatronic. But uh, not great storytelling. And I can kind of forgive it for Disney California Adventure because of the fact that they were fitting it in a space that already existed when they were... Um, replacing the California movie, which I'm forgetting the name of. Something Golden Dreams, I think it was called. Sorry. Uh, do you, do you, that was closed before I even got to experience okay. it. Whatever it was called. So they were filling a space that already existed. 
So I kind of, I'll give them a little bit of a pass of, okay, you only had so much space to work with. Florida, on the other hand, when they built it as part of new fantasy land, they essentially really could have made it as big as they wanted, taking the time to tell the story properly, and they didn't. It's a copycat attraction. So, yeah, Little Mermaid. Uh, they both have two different names so uh, on each coast, but not not good storytelling. Um, and not good animatronics. <laughs> well, I mean, Ursula's the phenomenal. Ursula and Ariel Scottle look great. Is, Scottle's Scottle, pretty good. But then when you go into Under the Sea and they're all... all yeah, the, there's a all, lot of robots yeah. instead of instead of audio animatronics. But I actually like the Under the Sea sequence. I will say that attraction was plussed a billion times when they changed it to black lighting. Do you, do you remember? Right, the first... The first time you went under to see, it was like jarringly bright in there and no one was really lit correctly. Well, it was so bright that you clearly could tell that you were in an attraction. Like you could see ceiling and stuff. And these days it's much harder to see that. And they, they did a j- good job fixing that aspect of it. But telling a story, still cool. The one story element I do like in it, though, is how the bubbles transform you underwater. In they drown you. They yeah. drown you. Yeah. I do like that. It's a nice little effect. I'll give yeah. it to you. It's nice. So let's go back to a good one. What was another one of your favorite storytelling attractions? So this one, is, I guarantee it's on your list. Let's hear it. Uh, Indiana Jones Adventure, Temple of the Forbidden Eye. That is on my list. Now, what I like about this attraction is everything from the pre-show, mm-hmm. where you watch the screen, you see his friend, he's telling you the story. Sala. And then you go through, you're going through this awesome, I, even the queue is awesome. Yeah. And if you have that decoder, you can and decode long. all the walls. It and is a very long Do you queue. know the decoder is going to be part of the app soon? Awesome. Yeah. And you can go through the whole thing, and it's enjoyable, even if you don't want to go on the ride. You could go through the whole thing and have a good time. And then once you're on the ride, they tell you, don't look into its eye, or bad stuff's going to happen. And mm-hmm. then, boom, bad stuff happens. And you go through kind of variations of classic Indiana Jones things Moments, that happen yeah. in the movie, but new twists. Yeah, I think, once again, the pre-show video does a good job of being very entertaining. It's very short, but gets the point across very easily. Don't look into the eyes of Mara. That's really what it comes down to. And there are little hints of that throughout the attraction, too. Like, right as you enter the cave, there's the the in the rock work. You see Mara, and they put, like, a blindfold over her eyes, kind of telling you. The one thing... I would say this isn't bad storytelling. This is just storytelling in a way that I don't care for so much is like a lot of attractions. The problem starts immediately. Like literally the first room you go into, you look into her eyes and you're screwed for the rest of the attraction. Right. I like more of a buildup to it where, and I, I feel like probably the best example of Building up to the, you know, something's gone wrong in an attraction is actually not a Disney attraction, it's Universal. The Mummy. Jurassic Park The Ride, I think, okay. does a fantastic job. The Mummy's pretty quick, Because I actually too. feel like The Mummy is the exact same as Indiana Jones, because it's like, well, that's oh, a roller coaster. don't look in, don't disturb The Mummy, and then you disturb them, and then they jump down. I would, n- don't ever compare those two attractions on this <laughs> Indiana show. Jones is on a different level. <laughs> different but it, level. This start reminds me of something similar. Sure, but I think Jurassic Park The Ride does a really great job of, you're going into this theme park, you're actually enjoying looking at these dinosaurs for half the attraction and then you hit the raptor cage and, and then it falls apart yeah and then yeah. that hadrosword knocks you off and then you know the stuff hits the fan and you're screwed but if that were indiana jones you'd start right at that raptor cage you know what i mean like yeah. i really like a build up to something's gone wrong and that's the only knock i would give to indiana jones adventure other than that yes phenomenal storytelling and once again i this more than anything, I don't think you need to know Indiana Jones films at all I don't, to enjoy this attraction. I actually think it's better not knowing. Because then, like, the one gag that I think is not great for the ride is the ball. I love the boulder scene. Oh, I love the... When it works. I love it when it works, but, like, it's from the first movie. Sure. And if you've seen the first movie, that's the only time it's like, well, they're doing it twice. The other things are the only ones that are kind of different from the movie. Could you imagine an Indiana Jones ride, though, where that wasn't part of it? I'm no, sure. I know they needed it. Like, yeah. guests expect it. Yes. It's one of the most... I mean, I would argue it is the most iconic image from any Indiana Jones film is the giant boulder. Like, it's phenomenal. Yes. So, 
that was on my list. So let's see. I, I think another one, although people don't necessarily love the attraction, I think Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage does a really good job telling the story. Like, there's no question of what's going on here. You're, it's, it's, you know, you're in a submarine. There's this technology where you can understand what the fish are saying. And then, you know, he loses his son again. Original story? Not so much. But as far as understanding what's happening, happening, beginning, middle, end, I think great job. Yeah, I fully agree. Like, you definitely get the story when you get on that attraction. And, like, it's not my favorite attraction. Mm -hmm. And I actually tell people not to ride it. (laughs) (laughs) What is it that you don't like about it? It's always, like, a super long wait. And then you feel super claustrophobic in it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I don't get claustrophobic. So it's like... The interesting thing is I do get claustrophobic and I'm not... That attraction doesn't bother me that much. I think if I sat for a moment and actually thought about like <laughs> the escape plan here, I'd probably freak out a little bit. I don't know. I've never had much of a problem in there. And I do get selectively claustrophobic, which is really annoying. But... Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think the story is pretty clear. Beginning, middle, end. Oh, for sure. Yeah. What's another one on your bad list? Um, bad storytelling. My bad list. Now, this one is an, I believe it's an opening day attraction. Let's hear it. Uh, storybook Land Canal Boats. I believe you are, yes, it was opening day, but the it was actually a different quote unquote story because they didn't have the models ready. They were basically just looking at plant life. And then later on, and I think it might have had a different name. In fact, I'm pretty definite it had a different name when it opened. So technically, I guess not opening it, but that doesn't matter. Now, when you get on this But boat, there is no story. Kind of. You get eaten by a whale to start the ride. Okay, I will give you that that is the most bogus thing ever because I hate that we're exiting his tail yeah which doesn't exist and they give a story of like it blew his tail off or something and i'm like okay that's not how it goes in the movie like in that uh, yes okay I'll yeah give so you, you get eaten by a whale and it's a very deceiving ride because when you're looking at fantasy land going through that whale's mouth is, looks awesome yeah i will agree it has a very good ap- uh, curb appeal that attraction yeah and then you go into it and the confusing part for me is they've done better job in recent years of fixing some of the models mm-hmm. but a lot of them don't look anything like the movie i'll give you that yes the more current ones definitely are m- much closer but there's somewhere like that that's not where so and so lived. Yeah, right. I will like, agree. That doesn't look like their house at all. But I don't think that that's a story. That's just a tour. The only story element I would give is the whale thing, which is but it's where storybook land. <laughs> that's true. Storybook <laughs> land. But they're vignettes from stories. I don't know. I would. That's a tough one to argue, in my opinion. Yeah, it doesn't have just a, because I feel like it's a. It has no story. That's how you're, I. You're visiting the magic kingdoms of the worlds that create in the animated features. Yeah. Well, if you, uh, you're taking a tour. What would you, if you could completely redo that attraction, but it's the same layout, it's the same little river, same little boats, what would you do with that space? What would you like to see that become? I think that you can make everything much bigger and have like animatronics within the area, like magnify some of the things. So you'd keep the same basic concept of visiting uh, different. Villages. In reality, I would tear the whole thing up. <laughs> I think it's going to happen. But <laughs> but if we're sticking to it still being there, yeah. I would make everything much bigger. Yeah. I And have a narrator. And not just a tour guide. Have like a character come to life. Like an animatronic starts talking to you when you get to each area or something. You know what could plus the attraction? Is if everybody had a pellet gun to shoot ducks. I would it. totally join. <laughs> I kid. I actually wish I kid, that I the boat guide. Peta, would, do would, not write me. The boat guide would treat it as uh, Jungle Cruise. Oh, yeah. Make it a farce. Yes. Yeah. That'd actually, that'd be interesting. Uh, yeah. That'd actually be, or maybe, oh, that should be like, there should be an after hours storybook land canal boats. Oh, my goodness. I would love that. That'd be fun. Storybook land after dark. Yeah, that'd be great. I think that's a win. That's uh, one of your terrible another ones, one. Jeff. You know what I'm going to go with? I'm going to go with a controversial one, and that's Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. I don't... I'm going to read the description that the website gives for the story of this, and you tell me if you've ever really caught this. 
Okay. Riding the attraction. You've ridden it many times, yes? Many, many times. Okay. Legend has it that a supernatural force dwells within the mountain. When gold was first discovered in the 1850s, a mining company was established. But soon, eerie things began to occur. Miners heard ghostly sounds. Cavens became frequent, and equipment mysteriously failed. Trains would take off and race through the mine and around the mountain driverless. Word got out that the mine was haunted and Big Thunder became just another ghost town. Years later, when eyewitness accounts had faded into folklore, new prospectors resurrected the mining company and began blasting into the spooky mountain once again. But as you may soon discover, some legends turn out to be true. Having ridden the ride yeah. numerous times... They need to do a better job of storytelling because none of that comes into effect. Okay. I was just under the impression it was a runaway train. The the thing, the part of that that I, I do hear frequently mentioned or referred to is that it's a driverless train. I have heard that before. There is no driver. When you look, there's no conductor of the train. So that I get. I didn't know it was haunted. I had no idea it was supposed to be To haunted. me, that makes the ride so much more exciting. And they should have something that... That's one of those situations where it's like, read the map, I guess. Although I doubt the map goes in that. That's but from the website. But they could fix that from like an old prospector telling the story as you wait in the line. Yeah, there's some. There's a disconnect between the story of the attraction and the attraction. And, you know, in some cases, it's actually fun to just be like, oh, it's a roller coaster, right? And then... As the years pass, you learn more and more about it. You learn the story, and it becomes this exciting thing. Like, it takes on a totally different meaning to you. I guess that's somewhat fun. But, yeah, that is completely uh, unknown to me as a rider. Yeah, I would never have a million years guessed that. I legitimately thought you were just on a runaway train through an old ghost town. In yeah. In the middle of the desert. No, nope, there's much more story to it than you realize. So... There's that. Uh, what's another one that you think does a fantastic job telling the story? We're back to good, right? Yeah. We are back good to turn. good. So this one is technically a show, but okay. it's an attraction, so I'm throwing it on the list. And it's gone bye-bye in the last year. Oh, let me see if I can guess. In the last year, it's gone away, and you think it did a great job telling a story. Which park is it in? It's in... Oh, Aladdin? Nope. Uh, which park is it in? It's in California Adventure. Disney California. Drawn to the Magic? No. In the last year. It's tough to be a bug. Oh, yes. By the way, I said Drawn to the Magic because Jeff Victor here is obsessed with Drawn to the Magic. Hey, it's the best show that Disney's <laughs> ever had as a walk around. You could stop for like 12 minutes, thoroughly enjoy yourself. It had three different characters plus three different uh, animated characters have come to life. And you could take photos and listen to amazing remix of their classic songs. It yeah. should still be in the park today. I, if you love Drawn to the Magic the way I love the Disneyland band. That is very much true. And if you don't know Drawn to the Magic, look it up on YouTube. There's many videos. It's wonderful. It, you were so obsessed with that show that you actually had a dream cast. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. I saw the show so many times that I think I've seen every animated character that could possibly be in the show be in the show. Unbelievable. So in any case, you're saying it's tough to be a bug. It's tough to be a bug. Yeah. They were teaching you about what bugs actually do for us as humans in society. Mm -hmm. And then halfway through, the villain of A Bug's Life comes in. Hopper. Hopper. And Played he by the infamous Kevin Spacey. I did not know that. Yeah. And then so Hopper comes in and he's mad that Flick is trying to teach humans about bugs. And then he brings in this thing where he shows video of humans killing bugs. And they basically fight it out. And then they have this grand, glorious finale of them pollinating. We're pollinators. Yeah. Um, and it has one of the coolest animatronics of any attraction. Yeah, Hopper was a great animatronic. I wonder where he is now. Aww. I, I mean, he's in Florida, but I wonder I wonder where the DCA one is. Hmm. He's resting. He's resting forever. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that attraction. And yeah, I would agree. It tells the story pretty well. And it's pretty... If you're not telling a story well in a 4D attraction, you've really done something wrong. Like, right. You know? But then the pre-show, I always loved going into that little hill, and then you see all the Broadway posters of them spoofing. You know Bob's where that. Versions. You know where that is in Florida, right? Where that attraction like lives. 
Do you not know? It's inside the Tree of Life at Disney's Animal okay. Kingdom. And that's that's where it originated. DC was a copycat of that. And they, you know, it's kind of cool to go in the tree. And right. It, it's, it's, it's cool. But yeah, I would agree. That's a good one. Another good one in my book is Star Tours The Adventures Continue. I think does a really good job setting up the scenario every time, which is even more difficult because... There's so many different storylines that could happen within the attraction. So I think they do a great job. The only thing I would say that they do a poor job of is continuity storyline wise. Oh, see, and that's what would take me out of the storyline telling. Because like when they jump between prequels and original, yeah. I would get super confused. So I think this is actually one where it benefits you not knowing the films, if that makes sense. Because, I would agree. But I think as far as if you take out the whole, this doesn't make sense in a storyline, if you look at the attraction solely as a story in and of itself, I think it makes sense. You know what's going on. I'm never confused. I think the setup of you're going through this, you know, airport type scenario to you're going to take a tour and then, oh, something goes wrong. Once again, immediately at the beginning, something goes wrong. But then it's awesome because there's someone that's on your ship that's smuggled away because they are the rebel spy. So that's actually, that was plussed once they did Adventures Continue. So... Yeah, that's that's a plus uh, storytelling, in my opinion, with the new version of the attraction. So, yeah, I think it does a really good job. I don't know. You agree? Disagree? I agree. I think it's weird that C-3PO is the pilot. I love it. Um, well, I like C-3PO. And also, and, I love... Okay, continue. Sorry. But I miss... Uh, is it Rex? Rex, yeah. Rex. Yeah. I miss Rex. He'll be back in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Playing the drums, I think. He's a DJ, I believe, yeah. in the cantina. But, so, one thing I will say... Setting up the story for that, I think it's great how the in the pre-show video they did a really nice job of like your pilot exits C three P go C three PO goes in there to fix something, I believe, and like wrongfully becomes the pilot. I think they do a really good job setting that up as to why C three PO is piloting the sh- the ship when I feel like a lot of in a lot of cases they might have just be like yeah just put him there nobody will question it and in this case they actually explain why they also do a really good job of explaining the I love the video of watching them prep your ship and my first time I did it I was I was like well that doesn't make sense that's not where we load right do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You walk into like basically a black area. That's not where we load the ship. Like this doesn't make sense this video, but they do a great job of you see the vehicle being lifted on the screen as you go to board. So I'm like, great. So they justify that. Good storytelling. The thing that drives me crazy, this is getting really minutia here, but on the video you see the doors open and the ship is empty. But when your doors open in real life, you see the crew ahead of you exiting so that drives me crazy and then it also drives me crazy that you are exiting in a different location than where your story ends so there's problems but overall i think it does a good job storytelling was that too nerdy geeking out over a little bit um the one thing i really like about it is like this actually easter eggs because when you go into that very first room and you you see the shuttle and then you see the projection on the wall where it has all the like the loading dock times and like Mm -hmm. places to travel um, where many people think just see symbols on the walls. Mm-hmm. Um, that's an actual language in Star Wars that you can fully translate. No, they don't have a decoder for that, do they? They need to come out with that. Um, it exists because the language is real. Okay. Um, real, but real in the sense real of Star Wars. Real is a make-believe language, but like real, like people can actually read that language. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a, I find that like super fascinating and... They have you ever have decoded, decoded anything? I've never decoded anything. Oh, we need to decode the entire attraction and put out a book. This of is everything. what they say in Star Tours. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be fun. Okay, what's another? Uh, so we're back to bad, right? Yeah, it looks well, like we're back to bad. Let's let's hear another bad one for you. What's the um, worst storytelling on a Disney attraction? The worst, the absolute worst for me. Mm-hmm. Is Snow White? Okay, it's on my list as well. Her scary adventure. Snow White's scary adventures. Is bad storytelling. If you have never seen Snow White and did not know the story... Which, let's face it, 
A lot of people probably haven't. I mean, a lot of people, I think, inherently know the story of Snow White, but the amount of people that have sat down and watched the Walt Disney Animation um, Walt Disney Animation Classic is probably kind of small number. And I feel like it's dwindling even more. Yeah. Although, interestingly enough, they are opening a character breakfast based on Snow White characters in Florida soon. I find that very interesting. She also has a really big ride in Florida, too. That's true. Seven Dwarfs Mine Train is pretty huge. But Scary Adventure, if you didn't know anything about the feature, yeah. you would know nothing about what happens doing that ride. I would agree with that. And I think the biggest, and I think you will agree with me, the biggest flaw in that attraction storyline-wise is the witch is dead and they lived happily ever after. Like that moment, that last scene where you see her get knocked off the mountain and there's, there's just a painting of, and that we don't have Snow White dead anywhere. We, you know, it's just a lot of question marks in that attraction. I, it's, I feel like in general, Fantasyland dark rides suffer from this. I think Pinocchio does a pretty decent job. Peter Pan's a little bit, mm. Yeah, I would make the case that most of the Fantasyland here is, suffers tremendously from storytelling. Yeah. And I almost put that in my quotes as like most of fantasy land yeah because you can argue peter pan doesn't make a lot of sense it jumps around you can argue uh pinocchio i would say is the best i think they do a pretty area. good job and that is like the newest is and it alice newest? in wonderland as alice well. in wonderland is phenomenal I, that is my favorite fantasy land dark ride mine is probably mr toads oh really yeah interesting i just think it's interesting that like it's such a small film that people don't even know about anymore yeah but then disney would never do this anymore, but you die. Yeah. At the end of the ride. And you're in Hades. Yeah. That's fun. So fun time. I, I just like I just enjoy that aspect of the ride is like Disney kills you and then you leave the ride <laughs> dead. Do you know which so that was like a short that was attached to another short and released in theaters. Do you know what the other short was? We're doing trivia early. Do you know what the other short was? I just n- no. It was so the title of the film was The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Right. So the first part I think was Sleepy Hollow, and the second part is The Wind in the Willows, Mr. Toad. So yeah, I would love a Sleepy Hollow attraction. I would love that. That would make me very You're happy. like Halloween overlay. Yeah, seriously. But I I love. It's so interesting because I'm not a huge fan of the Alice in Wonderland movie. But I love that attraction. I think that they did a fantastic job with that. But yes, overall, these attractions, listen, there's limited space. And I think especially when Disneyland opened, which is when most of the, like, Mr. Toad's opening day, Peter Pan's opening day, Snow White is opening day. I think they just counted on everybody seeing these movies, right? And that's just kind of how it works. Right. But now with, like, the invention of Netflix and all these other streaming services, People don't buy Blu-rays and DVDs as much anymore. But so they're some still these, watching them. Right. But some of these older films, the kids today don't necessarily have opportunities to watch some of them. Yeah. Especially Mr. Toad. Like, that's rare to watch to begin with. Yeah. Now, one on my worst list, which is actually one you really can't see today, and I'm curious where you land with this, is Splash Mountain. I don't think Splash Mountain does a very good job until the end telling a story. Is that on your list as well? So this is our battle mode. It was on one of my best. Best storytelling. Yes. Okay, now this is interesting. So here's the deal. Of course, this is based on the attraction, uh, on the movie Song of the South, which like people can't readily see these days. And I don't, until you're at that end and you're climbing the hill and it's a, don't throw me in that broad patch. Like, I don't think you really know what's going on so brer rabbit is trying to get to his happy place while brer fox and brer bear are trying to prevent him from getting to his happy place and they're trying to catch him so you go through the silly adventure of the fox trying to catch the rabbit but he ends up catching the bear in one scene and all this mishap happens until he catches him right before you go up the hill. Mm -hmm. And then Br'er Rabbit convinces him to throw him into the briar patch, but Br'er Rabbit was tricking him to throw him into the briar patch because he grew up in the briar patch, so he wasn't going to get hurt getting tossed off of it. And so as he gets tossed off, you drop. You think that that's super clear? And then he finds his happy place, and you sing a zippity-doo-dah day. Do you think that that's super clear in the attraction? Uh, I don't think they do a great job telling that story. I enjoy the story, but maybe it's because I know the story. Okay. Because it's clear to me when I see it. 
But I have also... It feels like a bit of a musical review to me. Yes. Each room has a different song, great songs, and I love the attraction. But I just don't think it's great storytelling until the drop. And then it's like, oh, I, I see what he's doing here. And I guess, I mean... Uh, what's the story you really need to know, right? Br'er Rabbit is trying to get away from Br'er Bear and Br'er Fox. And and I guess that's really clear. But the why isn't to me. And maybe I'm just stupid. The predators. I, okay, maybe that's, maybe that's just it. And a lot of Disney animated movies, they keep predators always as the villains. And they keep, like, happy animals more on the happy side. Now, I've got to ask, um, I would like to hear your Br'er Rabbit impression. <laughs> you just got so red. Can I hear it? Uh, give me a line. Please don't throw me down that bra patch. This is going to be the worst impersonation. Ever. Please don't throw me in that bra patch. That's that's actually not the worst impression I've ever heard you do. I do the best Mickey Mouse. Yeah, sure you do. Anyway, <laughs> you are so red right now. I love it. Hilarious. So those are some bads. Do you have any more goods on your list? I, I do have another good. Let's um, hear it. I completely dig the storytelling of this one because... If it's simple, Mm -hmm. if you don't take it as simple and you think it's much more complex than what it is, Flix Flyers. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Yes, it's definitely Flix Flyers. (laughs) It's Dumbo. No, it. If you took it more as complex than what it is, then it might not make a sense. And that's the Haunted Mansion. Okay, so that's on your best list. Yes. Hmm. The uh, explain. Because you start off and you have your creepy host. Okay. And then they let you know you're going into a haunted house. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. And is this room stretching? And then you go down and then you walk through where everything's kind of like the paintings are looking at you and they're changing. And just the storyline of the fact is you're going into a haunted house. There's deaths that happen here. But here's the thing. I think there's more story than that. I just don't think they explain it all that well. The bride's story can be a little bit confusing, and that's what they they base the movie on the bride's story, correct? Yeah, they definitely dive deep into that. Yeah. But as far as the house just coming alive because it had so many deaths in it and it's been haunted, mm-hmm. that when you see each individual area about the hauntedness of like that room, you get the the lady in the ball and then you go into her name is madame leota madame leota the lady in the ball I was just completely <laughs> blanking on it and then you go in you see the dining room scene yeah. and you see all the ghosts having a ball and then you go and figuratively you, and literally yes and then you go into the attic and you you meet the bride for the first time and then you go down and in, into the graveyard and you see all the grim grinning ghosts come to life and it's just to me it just feels like a tour of a haunted attraction okay is a tour a story i don't think so i'm gonna debate you on this one i and love was it on your worst list uh, no it's not but it's definitely one that i think like pirates of the caribbean has become classic and, and it's kind of one of those things that people would never say that that's bad in any way shape or form because it's such a classic and i agree it's a classic it's, it deserves its place in disney history i just don't think it's great storytelling i think that there was Honestly, I think what happened with this attraction, I've done a whole episode about the stories of the Haunted Mansion. I think there was just too many stories that it got to a point where we're like, okay, we can't really decide which one we're going to do. We're going to put little bits of everything and therefore it's not a great story. And I'm going to argue with you about this one thing because I know a lot of times we'll go see movies together and one of your favorite things to point out is you'll say, that actor was in a different movie than everybody else in this movie. Like they're just on a different level. They're not in sync with everybody else. And to me, the Haunted attraction, the haunted Mansion is that as an attraction. Because you so clearly have two different people's takes on a haunted attraction. There was an Imagineer that wanted it dark and scary, and that's the first half of the attraction. And then uh, there's an Imagineer that wanted it goofy, and that's the second half of the attraction. And for that sake... That's two different stories. Where would you split the half at? Uh, when you are thrown out the attic window. So I think up through the attic, it's pretty dark and scary. So the first two acts, then, I would say are dark and scary. Yeah, you're going through the hallways. You've got Madame Leota. You've got the ballroom. You've got the attic. That's all pretty dark. Right. The minute you start hearing the song, and I I would say, I'd say the attic is like the transition point. And then, yeah, once you're out the window, you're it's, it's a comedy at that point. Now, here's the question for you, then. The overlay, which... We get in California. Haunted Mansion Holiday, yep. 
how would you rate the story on that one? I think that that actually, let me think, what's the story? So, I mean, the story is, the narration goes that Halloween has taken over Christmas. And if uh, I think there's more of a through line with Haunted Mansion Holiday, which is kind of blasphemous to say. But I think, I think if you really look at the attraction, it's like, no, at least the theme of this is consistent throughout. Whereas in Haunted Mansion, traditionally, not so much. I don't know. That's my opinion. I feel like it's, to me, Haunted Mansion feels pretty consistent from beginning to end. Do you think so? It definitely starts off scarier with, like, the doors pushing out. Yeah. But as there's no, like, creatures really until you get past that room. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of starts to mellow out from there. Well, it's interesting because you... So one of the theories out there, and I don't say that I believe this theory because there's, you know, the argument can go in many directions, but... A theory I've heard out there is when you begin, you're you're an onlooker. You don't see any ghosts. You see what's happening. You see doors moving and knockers moving and stuff like that because because ghosts are doing it, but you can't see them. Then you go to Madame Leota. She you know brings it so that the she makes it so that the ghosts can be seen by you. That's the ballroom. And then you're seeing these very uh, you know see through ghosts like the way you would expect a ghost to see. So she has a seance for the guests. Yeah, and then. You get to the graveyard, and they look very different. They're they're no longer like that see-through self. They're more solid. And the theory is that when you go out that window in the attic, you're actually jumping to your death, and you're now one of them, which is why you see them differently. But there's th- there's reasons why that doesn't make sense either, because you know th- at the end they're like invite you back, uh, and they but they do say. Be sure to pick up your death certificate, meaning you died. So it, it goes back and forth. It's an interesting theory. I don't necessarily go for it. But once again, confusing story. I don't think it's a clear story. So it's interesting. I don't think it doesn't not make sense either. I think if you go in just saying, it's going to be a creepy house, it's fun. Yeah. But if you really are looking for a story, I honestly think it's a, it's a tough thing. If, I, if somebody said, hey, go make a Haunted Mansion movie, I would just research the heck out of every storyline that was you know developed for that attraction and just pick my favorite i think that's the best way to do it now i actually wouldn't make a movie on it i would actually make a mini series that'd be fun too based on each of the pictures in the room oh the four stretching portraits yes so each that'd mini be, series is based fun. on one I wonder of those if, portraits i wonder if they've done that like in comic book form i'm not really sure but uh, in any case, that, so that was on your best. I have one final best on my list, and that is Dinosaur, which is an attraction at Disney's Animal Kingdom. Have you done that? I have not done that. Okay, so D- Dinosaur, it's essentially the same ride system as Indiana Jones Adventure. But once again, they do a really fantastic job with the pre-show video. One thing I've learned making this list is that pre-show videos, as annoying as it is as a guest sometimes in line just wanting to get on the ride... They're really important as far as story is concerned, and they do a great job explaining why you're going in back in time to get this dinosaur, and you're right at the the moment where the meteors are hitting, and I think it's a really well done story in general, dinosaur. But you haven't done it. So. I haven't done it, so I am. I've seen video of it. I love dinosaur. It's great. The last time I was in uh, Animal Kingdom, mm-hmm. I was there for like an hour, and then I lost the group I was with, so I took the bus back to magic kingdom and spent the rest of the day in magic kingdom all right so you're a big fan of disney's animal kingdom it sounds like nice do you have any more on your bad list or your good list is done yes my good list is done i have one left on my bad list let's hear it and i just feel like it's a great ride with terrible theme and storytelling and that's space mountain yeah there's no story they try to like speak to you on those monitors but when you get to the monitor section you're walking by so quickly that you never can even sit. Oh, those see monitors them. aren't even a story. That's just a. Those are just, um, you know, the safety videos. Yeah. So it's an attraction in a land that. There's no story to Space yeah. Mountain other than you're going into space. I I don't even know of a story that well, was then we'll cha- developed. We'll change it. Ghost Galaxy. <laughs> yeah, Ghost Galaxy is fun. Uh, it's fun, but there's no, no story. story. No story. You have the mummy coming after you, trying to get you. Yeah, I guess the the hyperspace mountain. Probably has the most developed story of any Space Mountain. And it's so much fun. 
for me, this is another on my bad list now. This is an attraction that is, once again, in Disney's Animal Kingdom. You've probably never done it, but it's Kali River Rapids. And listen to this description. That, so Kali River Rapids is essentially uh, Grizzly River Run. It's just one of those types of water rides. Surprisingly, the one time I was in Animal Kingdom. You did ride this? I did Nala's River Rapids. Nala's River. It was based off of uh, The Lion King. I don't think that's a thing. I think it was. 2001 No, it's always been Cali River Rapids. Has it? Yeah. Why did I think it was Nala? Because Cali and Nala sound alike. I mean, maybe that's an overlay that should happen. I have done that right. Okay. Well, here's the story about behind it. During your expedition, you'll notice a startling change in the scenic forest beauty you encounter. Vivid green vegetation is unexpectedly transformed into a smoldering inferno of charred tree trunks while hazardous debris litters the riverbanks. And with that, the warning is clear. Illegal logging is destroying animal ha- habitats and disrupting the harmonious balance of nature. I definitely did not get any of that story when I wrote that ride. Yeah, it does not do a great job describing it. it. That's just a fun... You know, that was there like, we need a water ride, and how are we going to fit it into the story of, you know, uh, respecting nature in Disney's Animal Kingdom. It's like, eh, we'll put some logs on fire. That'll do it. And that's pretty much it. But I would say not a great job at telling the story of the attraction. But it is interesting how m- how much time is spent developing these stories that just kind of go nowhere in a lot of cases. So that's our list, I think, of the best and the worst storytelling attractions at the Disney parks. And even if it has a good or bad story, that's not judging how it is as a ride, though. Yeah, no, it can be a great ride, just not great at telling stories. And it can be an awful ride and have a great story. And I think it's really interesting that we actually had uh, them on the opposite lists. So, I don't know. What was it? We had Splash Mountain. So now that we've had a discussion, do you think Splash Mountain is good storytelling or bad storytelling? I, because I I know the story, I see the story when I when I ride the ride. Yeah. So I would say that in my point of view, I still think it's a good story. However, I do see your point of view where if you didn't really know what was happening, you just see really cool vignettes with songs. What about Haunted Mansion? Do you still think that's a good story? Uh, Haunted Mansion. Because I'll tell you, in both cases, you did not convince me. (laughs) (laughs) On Haunted Mansion, I would... I would definitely go back and consider it not being as well thought out of storytelling mode. However, if you think of it as just a haunted house. Yeah. I think out of everything comes across. I think out of everything, Twilight Zone Tower of Terror is probably, for me, wins absolute best storytelling and attraction. And I'd probably say Little Mermaid is like the worst. I would say Indiana Jones is my favorite for best storytelling in an attraction. And Snow White is definitely my worst. Cool, cool. Well, in any case, guys, I think that means... It's trivia time! Okay, Victor, do you want to hit me with a question first, or shall I hit you? I'll I'll go first. Okay. Um, So this is a two-parter. Feel free to answer one or both. Okay. How many parades and traveling shows have been featured in Disney California Adventure? What do you mean by traveling shows? They're not quite parades, but they're not quite sit-down shows either. So, like, Drawn to the Magic doesn't count? Correct. Oh, so, like, Newsboys would? No, it would not. That wouldn't count? It does its full show in one particular area. I guess you could count. Give me an example of a traveling show. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. I would say that uh, it would be Five and a Dime. They're the same as the Newsboys. But I feel like they do a little bit more as they travel on their bus. Because she's singing to you a different song the whole time. This is going to... I don't think you have a solid <laughs> answer to this trivia question. But let me get... So how many parades and... Tra- so you're not counting the Newsboys or you are? We'll count the Newsboys. Um, in its entire life, you're asking? Yes. F- f- six? I'm going to say... So for traveling shows... Yeah. It would be six. Six traveling. So let me think. So there's Five and Dime. There's Newsboys. There's the Green Army Men. Did then didn't did they do like High School Musical at one point? One, two, and three. D- or was that all one show, or did those count as separates? High School Musical one and two were very much the same show, and then three they made it a little bit different. It felt like I feel like there was a Camp Rock in there. Was there a Camp Rock show? That I don't remember ever seeing a Camp Rock show. Okay. Well. Tell me some other traveling shows that I missed. 
That's it. Okay. And then parades. I mean, they've had Paint the Night. They've had Pixar Play. They've had the, oh, I forget what it was called. It went to Disney's Hollywood Studios after. It was like a street block party. I um, can't remember the name of that one. And then, did they have any other parades? Oh, they did have the Main Street Electrical. Well, it was called the Disney's Electrical Parade. They had that. What ready, else? You ready for the list? Yeah. Okay, so Disney's Eureka, a California parade. Oh, that I don't remember at all. So that happened in when the park first opened to kind of celebrate California. Okay, I I, I want to look up that parade. That sounds yeah. interesting. Uh, Disney's Electrical Parade. Okay. Uh, block Party Bash. That's what I was thinking which of. Which is the one you were thinking of. Uh, Pixar Play, which is currently in Disneyland. Well, actually just ended because Pixar Fest is now over, so I think it's leaving the park. I don't know what they're doing with Pixar Play. But in any case, yes, that was at DCA. Yes, uh, Paint the Night. Uh huh. And then this is a holiday parade, Viva Navidad. Oh, that's a little street show. Yeah, yeah. Not quite a parade, but yeah, okay. It's a little it's around a little, the block. Sure, sure. Cool. Okay, well, for me, we were talking about Star Tours, the adventures continue. And of course, uh, we think that we agree that they do a good do- job storytelling, but they do tell a lot of stories. So I want to know which planets can you visit? What planets do you have the chance of visiting when you are on Star Tours The Adventures Continue? Ooh, that's a tough question. We'll break it into the two parts. So there's like basically, you know, the opening is you meet a villain of some sort. Then you go to one planet. Then you, there's the character disruption telling right. you what's going on. Then you go to a second planet. So I know, I know you go to Coruscant, Naboo. Um, I think they call it Malachor in this, but it used to be Korriban, according to the old EU. It's that red planet. Oh, the new one. Okay. Yeah. I might um, not have that on my list. Maybe it's not the most current list. And then I think you go to Endor. I feel like you did on the old attraction. Yeah, it's the old attraction. Okay. Yeah. Um, Alderaan, because you go through a minefield. I'm just kidding. The asteroid field. It's just a blown up planet. Um <laughs> That was some Star Wars nerd joke right there. I like that. It's good. No, in the well, you go to the snowy Mon place. Mon Calamari, right? Hoth. Hoth. Yep. Um, Mon, what's Mon Calamari? I think it's the water planet. Oh, okay. I feel like it's you want to hear the list one. I have yes. according to Wikipedia. Hoth, Tatooine, Kashyyyk, and Jakku are in the first portion of the attraction. I forgot they added the new. And then Coruscant, Naboo, Death Star, and Crate are your choices in the second part. There may be more now. I'm not 100% sure. So this is the third iteration of the ride. Okay. Because there's the original. Yeah. Then we had the the revamp, and then they added all the new stuff, and they took some of the older stuff So you're saying I'm wrong? Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. There's just many answers. Okay, cool. Because we definitely visit um, Naboo and the prequel stuff. They removed the prequel, didn't they, from the ride? I don't know. It's interesting because when they add new ones, I don't know if they take away like the most previous one. I don't ride it enough to know. But um, but yeah, there's a lot of planets you can go to now in Star Wars The Adventures Continue, which makes it really impressive that they keep a pretty good storyline there. I think they do a nice job. But in any case, that's going to do it for the show. Why don't you tell folks where they can find you and what you do? Um, you can find me on Instagram at Jeffrey Victor. Um, I... I am a professional dance teacher, and I train a lot of uh, actors on... Any Disney Channel stars? I, Disney Channel stars? I used to represent Dean Jones, who's famous from all the old um, Herbie movies from Disney Jeez, way back Louis. in the 70s. But I mean, in your dance studio, don't you train some Disney kids? Oh, yeah. I've worked with like the cast of like Shake It Up and like Allison Stoner and all those... like kids that come into like oh we're gonna have dance on our show we need to learn how to dance so i i definitely help treat not treat train them <laughs> how to uh how to move their bodies in simple ways that look more fancy than what they are cool excellent and uh guys of course make sure you leave those five star ratings and reviews on itunes for disney coast to coast to help other disney fans find the show more easily we have our twitter poll every single week on twitter which becomes part of our sunday show so make sure you're following d-i-z-n-e-y-c-t-c on twitter and also over on instagram d-i-z-n-e-y-c-t-c to take play to take part in the daily disney decision every single day over there other than that folks have a magical day bye thanks for watching disney coast to coast. Have a magical day. <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at 
DisneyCoastToCoast.com.